Hello, I'm Amy McNulty, and I'm honored to stand before you today. My story, like many of yours, is one of perseverance and hope. It is the story of providing for a family and hoping to create a foundation for them to have a fulfilling future. My husband, Michael, and I dream of sending our daughters to college without being burdened with debt so they can find fulfilling careers that allow them to purchase their own homes where they can create futures of their own. Shortly before our first daughter was born, we decided that Scranton would be the place where we would raise our family. We felt confident that we could afford a home and we had a solid support system here. We purchased our starter home in 2010, just a block from where President Biden himself once called home. Our daughter Isla was a few months old and we welcomed our second daughter Muriel just over a year later. We faced a lot of financial pressures as first time homeowners with two young daughters. But we always stayed focused on love and cherished memories, dreaming of a brighter tomorrow. Now, 14 years later, we still live in that starter home. A few things have changed. Our girls are now 14 and 12. They've grown up, but our home hasn't gotten any bigger. Our one shower works extra hard these days, and there's a daily battle for time in there, the most unfortunate casualty being my husband. <laughs> Michael and I both have careers in education. I was the first in my family to go to college and now spend my days helping other first-generation students at my community college succeed. So for our family, there was never a if we could afford it. As our girls get older, those financial pressures are still there. But thanks to President Biden's unwavering commitment to families like ours, for the first time in a long time, we are hopeful. When President Biden expanded the child tax credit, it put an extra $600 in our pocket every month. That meant a lot to us. Not only did it give us a little breathing room during the pandemic, it also let us glimpse a future where we could really start saving for our daughter's college education. Now we're thankful that President Biden is fighting to make that child tax credit permanent so families like ours can keep saving and keep looking to the future. We're thankful that President Biden is fighting to make it easier for us to upgrade to a larger home that makes, meets our needs. $10,000 easier, in fact, a game changer for families reaching for their first home or trading up from that first home as their family grows. And while other politicians push tax breaks for the super wealthy, who already have more than enough, we're thankful that President Biden is fighting to cut taxes for middle income families like ours. So we get the view from Scranton. Yes, yes. He is fighting for us and knows what it's like to grow up where we are. Just can't understand what it's like. It's surreal to stand here today sharing our journey with you all. But it's with immense pride that I introduce a leader who understands the struggles of families like mine who champions the aspirations of working class and middle income America. It is my honor to introduce President Joe Biden.
thank you, thank you, thank you. I think I should go home now. <laughs> Except I'm already home. Thank you. Take a seat if you have one. Amy, thank you for that introduction. Including your husband, Michael, whose uncle, Jimmy McNulty, was the former mayor and grew up with me in Scranton, Pennsylvania. You know, uh, thanks to the mayor, Paige, excuse me, I was going to talk about the old mayor, Paige Cognetti, uh, for that welcome. And she's been incredible. She's been with me all along the way. It's always great to be with uh, one of America's best governors, and I mean that sincerely, Josh Shapiro. He's the best. Stand up, man. Stand up. I think I think Josh and a lot of people are always tired of hearing me talk about Scranton, but uh, it, uh, but you know, Scranton's a place that climbs into your heart, and it never leaves. I mean that sincerely. It's home that's a special thing that, that's in your heart. For me, it was 2446 North Washington Avenue, just a block away from Amy's house. We used to come back after morning mass to St. Paul's on Sunday. St. Clair's wasn't built until I had moved. And my grandfather, who worked for the newspaper, and my uncles would hold court around the kitchen table with a guy who was sort of the uh, the David Broder of the, of the Pennsylvania Fred and Scranton Press. You think I'm kidding? It wasn't, but anyway, and uh, he would uh, they'd they'd come and have breakfast at the table, and a kid could wander around the table where the adults were sitting, but you could uh, but you could never sit at the table, and uh, I'd walk up and stand next to my grandpa, and while he was while they were having conversation, and they were talking about what they talk about what was going on in the neighborhood, they talk about what was going on in the world. They're all learned men, and, uh, and I learned a lot here in Scranton. I learned that money doesn't determine your worth. My grandfather would tell me, Joey, nobody, nobody's more worthy than you, and everyone's your equal. And that was, a, no, that, that was. I learned that no one's looking for a handout. All anybody wants is a fair shot, a fair shot at making, and they deserve a fair shot. My dad had a saying. He said, Joey, a job's about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. It's about respect. It's about being able to You know, people like Donald Trump learned very different lessons. He learned the best way to get rich. People who work for a living did, not him. He learned that telling people you're fired was something to laugh about. I guess that's how you look at the world when you're in Park Avenue or Mar-a-Lago. But if you grew up in a place like Scranton, nobody handed you anything. You paid your taxes. You made sure of being told you're fired wasn't entertainment. It was a nightmare that people worried about. And all people knew, all I knew about the people like Trump who looked down on us were the people that haven't changed. They wouldn't welcome us in their homes and their clubs. Folks, where we come from matters. When I look at the economy, I don't see it through the eyes of Mar-a-Lago. I see it through the eyes of Scranton, and that's not hyperbole. That's a fact. Where honesty and decency matter, where faith matters, where family is everything. Where we grew up knowing in our homes that Wall Street didn't build this country, the middle class built this country and unions built the middle class. <laughs> to build an economy from the middle out and the bottom up, not the top down, because when you do that, the poor have a ladder up, the middle class does well, and the wealthy still do very well. We all do well. There's a stark contrast from my opponent. He looks at the economy from Mar-a-Lago, where he and his rich friends embraced the failed trickle-down policies that have failed working families for more than 40 years. Scranton values or Mar-a-Lago values. These are the competing visions for our economy. 
and they raise questions of fundamental fairness to the heart of this campaign that I want to talk to you about a little bit today. Folks, does anybody really think the president's tax code is fair? Raise your hand if you think it's fair. I'm not joking. Well, neither do I. I'm a capitalist. If you want to, if you're able to go out and make a million bucks, fine. That's okay. But just make sure you pay your fair share in taxes. A fair tax code is how we invest in the things that make this country strong. Health care, education, defense, and so much more. But here's the deal. For more than 40 years, our Republican friends have promised that the best way to grow the economy is from the top down. But here's what they don't tell you. It's never worked. The benefits don't trickle down. And the very wealthy pay less in taxes. And we have to borrow more and invest less in the things that families So much more. Think what happens when the factory closes in Scranton or anywhere around the country, when a school is underfunded, when inequity grows larger and larger. It puts the middle class further and out of reach and rips the dignity and pride and hope out of communities all across the country, including right here in Pennsylvania. Folks, trickle down economics failed the middle class. It failed America. And the truth is, Donald Trump embodies that failure. He wants to double down on trickle down. His failure starts with his $2 trillion tax cut that overwhelmingly benefited the wealthiest and biggest corporations and exploded the federal debt when he was president. Donald Trump added more to the national debt than any president of the United States in a term in all of American history, more to the national debt. Meanwhile, when the pandemic hit, Trump failed the most basic duty any president owes the American people a duty to care, and a duty to respond. Remember when he told us, don't worry, this will all be over by Easter. <laughs> Remember when he told us, literally, inject bleach. <laughs> Bless me, Father. <laughs> Look. Think about it. Think about it. Because he failed to care, not only did people die, but millions of Americans lost their jobs, their homes, their livelihoods. On Trump watch, on Trump's watch in the four years he was president, we lost nearly three million jobs were lost. 275,000 of those jobs lost right here in Pennsylvania. In the Scranton area, Trump lost 17,400 jobs. 180,000 manufacturing jobs lost nationwide including 37,000 manufacturing jobs right here in Pennsylvania. There are only two presidents on record in all of American history that left office with fewer jobs than when they entered office. Herbert Hoover. And yes, Donald Herbert Hoover Trump. <laughs> Look. Trump's running again on the same trickle-down, failed trickle-down policies. Nothing's changed. Just a few months ago, at a closed-door event in Mar-a-Lago, he told his millionaire and billionaire donors the following. This is a quote. You're rich as hell, and we're going to give you tax cuts, end of quote. And then they all laughed about it. Not because they didn't think it would happen, because they knew it will happen if he's elected. How does that make me feel? How does it make you feel? How does it make the people I grew up with feel? I think it's outrageous. Trump wants to renew another round of billionaire tax breaks and corporate giveaways. And look, I come from the corporate state of the world, Delaware. I represented for 36 years. They're entitled to make a fair profit. It makes sense. There's more corporations incorporated in Delaware than every other state in the nation combined. But this is ridiculous what's going on now. You know, there are about 1,000 billionaires, billionaires in America. Do you know what the average federal tax rate for a billionaire is today in America? For real, 8.3 percent. That's how much federal tax. No, I'm serious. Not a joke. Far less than the vast majority of Americans pay in federal taxes. No billionaire should pay a lower tax rate than a teacher, a nurse, a sanitation worker. I mean it.
And that tax break that he passed several years ago is about to expire. But Trump wants to give another billionaire tax break. Listen to what he says. Trump says his MAGA friends want to, quote, terminate. I love his terminology. Terminate the Affordable Care Act. That would mean over 100 million Americans with pre-existing conditions who now have health care because the Affordable Care Act would lose their coverage. 100 million. It means millions of young people who kicked off their parents' health care policies once they turned 26. The Affordable Care Act is paid for by a surtax on the very wealthy investment income. Trump wants to get rid of that. And as a consequence, would cost millions of Americans who lose coverage an average of additional $6,000 a year to maintain their health care. It would mean billionaires would get, as a consequence of not having to pay the tax anymore, another $3.5 million tax cut per billionaire. You heard me right. Billionaires would each get an additional tax cut every year of $3.5 million. That's 70 times what a typical family here in Scranton makes in one year. I have a better idea. As soon as I came to office, I expanded tax credits through the Affordable Care Act and saved millions of Americans another $800 per person per year on their health care premium. <laughs> health care should be a basic right. Those tax credits going to expire next year, though. And I want to make those tax credits permanent. The first thing I'll do if I'm reelected is make them permanent. <laughs> Folks, and my plan calls for a minimum federal income tax of 25 percent, just 25 percent on billionaires. Well below the top rate, but fair, and they can afford it. You know how much money that would raise? That would raise $500 billion over the next 10 years. $500 billion. <laughs> You'd drop in the bucket for them. They wouldn't have to sell one single bit of their assets. And imagine what we could do for America. Imagine a future with affordable child care, paid leave, home care, elder care, and more, like every major country in the world has. Of all this is not only good for families, it creates jobs, it generates growth, it generates income, it generates economic vitality. Because guess what? When you have child care and you don't have to go out and hire somebody, you can go to work. Gener I asked the Treasury Department to do a study. What would, what would, what's the effect of this? The effect of what I'm talking about is to increase, increase economic growth. We have the most successful economy in the world today. But folks, how does Trump pay for these billionaire tax cuts? Well, Trump recently said Social Security and Medicare, quote, here's his quote, there's a lot you can do in terms of cutting, end of quote. Well, right on cue, the MAGA Republicans in Congress released their budget, which hasn't gotten nearly enough attention. The budget they propose for next year would raise the retirement age in Social Security and it was slash Medicare. Think about that for a second. MAGA Republicans want billionaires to pay less in taxes, want seniors to work longer before they can retire on Social Security benefits, and they want to cut Medicare. I got a better idea. Let's protect Social Security and Medicare and make the very wealthy begin to pay their fair share in high taxes. Whether you're liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican, independent, whatever you are, think about it. We're not asking much. Just asking for just basic fairness. You know, I've already been delivering real results in a fiscally responsible way. But I know not everyone's feeling it. Just the other day, a defeated-looking guy came up to me and asked if I could help. He was drowning in debt. I said, I'm sorry, Donald, but I can't help you. That's what I can do. Look, on a serious note, since I came to office, 
I've already cut the federal deficit and all the stuff they talk about what we've done. And I'm going to be self-serving a little bit. Every other, every objective alternative points out we've had the most successful economy of any major economy in the world so far. A lot more to do. But guess what? During the whole time, I've been able to cut the federal deficit at the same exact time to over $1 trillion. $1 trillion. And I signed a bipartisan budget deal that will cut another trillion dollars over the next decade as well. And I know what to cut. I want to cut the federal deficit even more by making big corporations the very well to begin to finally pay their fair share. We're not asking anything that's unusual. Under my plan, nobody earning less than $400,000 will pay an additional penny. I hope you're all able to make $400,000. I never did. But they're not going to pay an extra penny in federal taxes. That's a promise. Nobody. Not one penny. You know, I have to say, if Trump's stock in the Truth Social, his, his company, drops any lower, he might do better under my tax plan than his. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Folks, look. I want to cut tax on the hardworking folks here in Scranton and all across the country in Claymont, where I've moved from Scranton to Claymont in Delaware, all across the country, like Amy's family. In fact, the child tax credit I extended during the pandemic put up to $300 per child, per child, in the pockets of around 40 million working families. And it literally cut child poverty in half. And we still reduce the deficit. We still reduce the deficit. That included helping 1.4 million families, nearly 2.4 million children right here in Pennsylvania. Republicans refused to extend it, which raised taxes on working families. I want to restore it, restore the expanded child care tax credit, because no child should live in poverty in this country. No child. We've got a lot more work to do. I know the cost of housing is so important. I want to provide families like Amy's the $10,000 tax credit to help them buy their first term or trade up for a little more space. Well, no, it's important. And by the way, it will grow the economy. When Trump was president in 2020, 55 of the largest corporations in America, the Fortune 500, made $40 billion in profit and paid zero, zero on federal income taxes. Well, guess what? I came along and took care of the sin. Not anymore. <laughs> Thanks to a law that I wrote and signed, big corporations now have to pay a minimum. They should be paying more, a minimum of 15% tax. There's a start, but not enough. <coughs> By doing that 15% tax, they pay for every program that people are now benefiting from and still cut the deficit by $70 billion. And by the way, that 15 percent is still less than working people pay in federal tax pay in federal taxes. It's time to raise the corporate tax minimum tax to at least 21 percent. So every big corporation finally has to pay their fair share. But, you know, Trump and his MAGA friends want to get rid of the corporate minimum tax. With the same law, I gave Medicare the power to negotiate lower prescription. I've been working on taking on Big Pharma my whole career. But guess what? If I put you on Air Force One, we flew out of here, and you went, you name, you took a prescription you had from a drug company in America. I will take you any city you name, whether it's Berlin, whether it's 
in Canada, whether it's in Hungary, wherever it is. Exact prescription. No, not, not a joke. And by the way, for example, seniors beginning in 2024, no matter how much their prescription drug costs are, they'll never have to pay more than $2,000 a year, no matter what. And by the way, Companies will still make money. They'll still make a significant profit. Still make a significant profit. It helps reduce it. By the way, when we do this, it has a benefit. And that's already part of the law I passed. But guess what? Not only does it reduce the federal deficit, the help of the prescription holder, it reduces the federal debt. You know how much the first tranche of this has done? It's reduced the federal debt billion dollars. Why? Because Social Security, Medicare does not have to pay out 400 a month. They're paying out $35 a month. But Trump's committed if he's reelected from he gets elected again. He wants to get rid of the law and give Big Pharma the power to charge again whatever you want, which will also increase the We can't. And that same law empowers the IRS to go after the super wealthy. You know what? You ever, it's amazing how the, we had passed legislation increasing the number of auditors. Guess who wanted them all cut? No, I'm not joking. Republicans. Why? Because it takes an awful lot of sophistication to be able to go through the tax returns of these billionaires to know what's going on. But while you work hard and pay your taxes, Trump wants to give his billionaire friends the power to avoid paying even what they already owe, not what they should be paying. I know if you didn't know better, you think I'm making this up, but you can check it all out. Folks, he's coming for your money, your health care, and your Social Security. And we're not going to let it happen. We're not going to, can't let it happen. Look, let me close with this. As you've observed, I can't hide it. Scranton fills me with an enormous pride. My mom didn't live in Scranton permanently since 1954. I swear to God, whenever she was asked, no matter where we were, Mrs. Biden, where you live, where you're from, she said, Scranton. You know anybody who's from Scranton that still doesn't brag about being from Scranton? <laughs> Look, because I see here what I saw in Claymont, Delaware, we moved. Used to be a big steel town with 4,000 workers, all gone now, although we're back for, with other growth. Claymont, Delaware, and what I see so many towns around America, a deep pride, a deep, deep pride in your work. A deep pride in your family, a deep pride in your community, in your country. I've always thought the World War II monument downtown by City Hall says so much about Scranton. My Uncle Ambrose Finnegan, Bosey Finnegan from North Washington, he served and died in World War II. Right after D-Day on Sunday, all four of my mother's brothers signed up to go fight in the military. In those days, you could do it. Brothers could go off to war together. Fathers and brothers could do the same. In that war, I, and everybody called him Bozy Finnegan. Bozy was a hell of an athlete, but Bozy joined the Army Air Corps before there was an Air Force. And his name is etched. Scranton, I grew up understanding we have many obligations as a country, but we only have, and I got in trouble for saying sacred obligation. 
That's to equip those we send to war and take care of them and their families when they come home or if they don't come home. I don't want to lose my temper in this, but I think about the statue in town now that I'm commander in chief. And I had them double check my memory is correct that Uncle Bozy Ambrose J. Finnegan's name is etched on that statue. And I have to say, there are a lot of things that Donald Trump has said and done that I find extremely offensive. But one that offends me the most is when he refused his president to visit an American cemetery outside of Paris when he was president. Why? He said that those soldiers who gave their lives were, quote, was his quote, suckers and losers. Suckers and losers, he said it. Who the hell does he think he is? Who does he think he is? These are heroes. These soldiers are heroes. Just as every American has served this nation. Believing otherwise, that alone is disqualifying for someone to seek this office. Thank God I wasn't standing next to him. As I've said, Donald Trump looks at the world differently than you and me. He wakes up in the morning in Mar-a-Lago thinking about himself, how he can help his billionaire friends gain power and control and force their extreme agenda on the rest of us. Listen to what he says. He says, quote, I'll be dictator on day one. Quote, I am your retribution. He promises, quote, a bloodbath if he loses. This guy denies January 6th. Listen. Listen to what he says. Because you know he means it. I wake every morning thinking about how to make life better like you do for working and middle class families here in Scranton and all across. And we, the people. Maybe that's why millions of everyday folks are empowering our campaign. So far, one point hundred and fifty thousand brand new this time around, and they're new contributors. But guess what? Ninety-seven percent of these contributions were under two hundred dollars. It matters. You matter. My grandfather would tell me when I walked out the door in North Scranton, North, 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 Scranton, in North Washington Avenue in Scranton, he yelled, Joey, keep the faith when I was a kid. My grandmother would yell, no, Joey, spread it, spread it. Let's keep the faith. Let's spread it. Let's remember who we are. We are the United States of America. There is nothing, nothing beyond our capacity. But when we act together, God bless you all. And may God protect our troops. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Thank you.